One of the most important things to understand as an animator is spacing. The careful manipulation of the space between drawings or images can both create physical believability and a feeling of energy or life. In this lesson, we're going to jump into Blender and create a simple piece of animation, which will help you to understand how to control spacing and the benefits that the different methods provide. Hello, I'm John Knowles, and this lesson is part of my Intermotion course, which teaches the foundations of character animation within Blender. The entire course will be available for free on YouTube. And if you'd like to make use of the demo files and rigs as you follow along, they're also available for free using the link in the description. If you've ever seen hand-drawn animation drawings, you may well have noticed diagrams in the corner of the paper. These are known as timing charts and a way of indicating the spacing that's to be used within a piece of animation. Now, timing charts aren't typically used within 3D animation, but understanding how to manually control your spacing is extremely important. To help understand this, we're first going to animate a ball using a frame-by-frame -frame approach, similar to that used within hand-drawn animation, before recreating the same animation with more commonly used 3D animation techniques. To give you a place to start, you can download this file from the course resources, but it's really very simple. We just have two spheres and a ground object, and I've set the viewport shading to flat in order to create a 2D appearance. Whilst we can actually animate within any of Blender's different workspaces, the animation workspace comes with the default layout, which works very well. To the left, we have the camera viewport, which has overlays and gizmos disabled to provide a clear view of our final image. And then on the right hand side, we have our main 3D workspace, where we can interact with our characters or the objects that we're animating. In the lower part of the workspace, we have the dope sheet, which is like an expanded view of the timeline that can be found in the other workspaces. So the first thing that I'd like to do is to record the initial position of this blue ball here. To do that, we're going to select it, then press the I key to insert a keyframe on frame one. You can see down here in the dope sheet that a keyframe has been added on frame one. And if I just roll this down, you can see a keyframe has been saved on our location rotation and our scale channels here. Then if we also look over into the property panel, you'll see that all of our values here are now colored yellow. This indicates that we have a keyframe set on the current frame. Now, the next thing that I'm going to do is to define our contact position where the ball impacts the ground. So I'm going to move ahead to frame nine here, just hit G and move this down on the Z axis until it's contacting with the ground. Now, having done that, no keyframe has been set. And if we look over here in the property panel, we've got some different colors. A green color indicates that the value is controlled by an animation curve but that it doesn't have a keyframe on the current frame. An orange color shows that value has been changed, but not saved. And what this means is if I go ahead and move the time here, our ball just pops back to its original position. So again, I'm going to translate this ball back down again, or if you wish to, you can actually enter a value for it here in the properties panel. Once we've done that, we simply have to remember to press I to set another keyframe. With that done, I'm now going to select my first keyframe down here in the dope sheet and hit Shift D to duplicate it, and then move it over and drop it on frame 17. Since I want to create a looping cycle, this will bring the ball back to its original position. So what we can also do is change our end frame now, and I'm going to set that to frame 16. So one less than our final frame here. That's because after frame 16, we would move back to frame one, which would be a duplicate of frame 17. Now to frame up our animation here within the dope sheet, we can hold down the middle mouse button to move things around and control and middle mouse will allow us to zoom in and out. We can also hit the home key and that will frame everything up for us nicely. So what we've done so far is to define the timing of our animation. We've set our key poses at the top and the bottom, and then we have to define the spacing between those poses. By default, Blender will actually apply some interpolation to create all of the in-between frames. So if we hit the space bar, we can play this back and see what that looks like. Now, whilst we've got some smooth motion with some ease in and ease out at the top and bottom, this isn't very convincing as a bouncing ball. So I'm gonna pause that and we'll have a look at why. So at the moment, because it's easing out at the top, but then easing at the bottom, it feels as if it's slowing down unnaturally before it hits the ground. 
we really want the ball to be accelerating all the way down to the bottom and then changing direction rapidly and decelerating as it reaches the top again. So what I'm going to do is to change this interpolation here so that we have full manual control over it. So with my mouse over the dope sheet, I can just hit the A key to select all of my keyframes here. And then if we hit the T key, we can adjust the keyframe interpolation. By default, Blender is using a Bezier interpolation. That's what's giving the ease in and the ease out. We could change this to linear and that will give us even spacing. But what I want to do is to change it to constant. Having done that, if we hit the spacebar again to play things back, you'll see that we just pop between the positions that we've set manually. So now I'm going to head back to frame one and we can start to plan out the spacing that we want to use. And to do this, I'm just going to hit the T key to open up my toolbar and select the annotation tool. And then I'm going to mark out my top and bottom positions here and figure out the spacing that we want to use. So what I'd like to do is initially set keyframes on twos. What that means is we'll save the position of the ball on every other frame. Once we've done that, we can check out how things are working. And if we're happy, we can move things onto ones to create a smoother result. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to divide this up on thirds. So up at the top here, we have frame one and at the bottom, frame nine. And I'm going to divide this up so that on twos, this will become frame seven. If I split it again into thirds, we have frame five up here. And if I split it once more, we will have our frame three up at the top here. So with that defined, I can hit the W key to get back to my selection tool and the T key just to hide that toolbar. So now I'm going to work through and set these positions on the ball. So on frame three, I'm just going to hit G and move this down slightly and hit I to set a key. Move ahead to frame five, G, move it down. Again, I to set the key. And we'll do the same for frame seven. Now, if we move through, we can see that we're easing out of that top position and then moving quickly down to frame nine. So we want to do the same thing on the other side here. So I can actually just duplicate these existing keyframes. So with frame seven selected, I'll hit shift D, and move that across to frame 11. Frame five is duplicated to 13. And frame three will duplicate onto frame 15. So with that done, let's head back to frame one and press the space bar to see what we've got. So I think that's working pretty well, but the result is a little bit choppy because we're holding each image for two frames. So to get a smoother result, we can break this down further onto ones. So what I'm going to want to do is just once again, split this up into thirds. So frame eight will be here, frame six, frame four, and finally frame two up at the top. So we can now, again, just hit the W key and the G key. Let's just move this down ever so slightly. So to key, frame four, Set another key. And frame six. Put that down. Save a key. And frame eight. Again, let's move that down. And once again, we can duplicate these over to the other side. So frame eight becomes frame 10. Frame six, across to 12. Frame four to 14 and frame two will become frame 16. So now if I head back to frame one, we can play this back. And we now have a far smoother result. Now, whilst that workflow has given us great result for our bouncing ball, it's not a very flexible way of working. If I now wanted to change the timing or adjust how high this ball bounces, I'd have a lot of work to do to recreate this frame by frame. So instead, we're going to switch over to the yellow ball and look at a different way of working 
to set our spacing. So once again, I'm going to hit I to insert a keyframe on frame one. We'll move to frame nine and place this down on the ground, set another keyframe, and again, duplicate our frame one over to frame 17. Playing this back again, we have the original pause spacing that Blender has given us. So what we can do is head over into the graph editor to see what's going on. And to do that, we can roll our mouse here over the dope sheet and hit control tab. And if you're not familiar with the graph editor, what we're seeing here is the value mapped out on the Y axis and a time mapped here across the top on the X axis. If I roll down this little arrow here, again, we can see all of our different animation channels. Now our Z location curve here is what's controlling the up and down of the ball. And if we take a look at it, we can see that we have this ease out at the start, where as our time changes, the value changes only a small amount. The more our time progresses, the steeper this curve becomes, which means our value is changing faster. Then as we get to the bottom here, again, the rate of change in value is much smaller as we increase in time. So that shows that we are slowing into this bottom position. The same is true on the other side, where we slow out of this bottom position, accelerate through the middle and slow down again as we reach the top. So you want to adjust this curve to help adjust our spacing. The problem is in the graph editor, it's very easy with the default settings to accidentally select curves, which you don't intend to, especially when the keyframes are close together or overlapping. So there are a couple of preferences that we can change to help with this. So I'm gonna hit control and comma to open up my preferences. And if you go to the animation tab here and down into the F curve section, we can enable this only show selected F curve keyframes option. Once that's on, if I just close my preferences, you'll see that all of our keyframes have disappeared from our curves and we can no longer select them directly within the graph editor. So instead, in order to select that Z curve, we need to go over and click on it here at the left. So now with our Z location selected, we now have the ability to select and manipulate any of the keys on this curve without accidentally selecting any of these other curves here within the graph editor. Now, the other preference that I like to change is this unselected opacity option. And I just drop this down to about 0.15. And what that does is just takes all of the unselected curves and just drops them back in opacity a bit so that they become a bit less distracting within the graph editor. So if I'm working on one of these other curves, I can still see that Z curve there, but it's not going to get in the way. So now if we select our Z location, what we want to do is to change the shape of this curve to manipulate how the ball is moving. And if we just select our blue ball for a moment and select its Z location curve, we can take a look at what's happening here. So we've got the slow change of value here at the start, which means we're easing out of that top position. And we have a rapid change of value down into this bottom position and back out again. So this is the shape of curve that we want to be generating over here on the yellow ball. So if I select that again, what we can do is select this keyframe at the bottom here and we can change these handles. At the moment, if I try to move one of the handles, it will move the one on the other side as well. But if I select the keyframe itself, we can hit the V key and change the handle type. If I change it to free, then I can select one of these handles, hit the G key, and I can move it to shape our curve as we want. If I do the same on the other side and bring that up, you can see that we're able to create this much steeper curve here. So now if we go back to the start and play this back. Our two balls have a very similar animation. The benefit of using the F curves here within the graph editor to manipulate our spacing is that we now only have three keyframes here on our bouncing ball. So if we wanted to change the timing at all, it's a lot easier. If I, for example, were to grab 
that keyframe on frame nine and bring it back two frames and grab this one and we can bring that back four frames. When I play it back, we have a much faster bounce. And if we look in our graph editor, you can see that our curve shape is the same and that's what's dictating our spacing. Trying to do this with the blue ball would be extremely difficult. Now the only way to improve as an animator is through hands-on practice. So with each lesson, I'm going to be including an exercise for you to complete by yourself using what you've learned. For this lesson, I'd like you to take an object, it could be a sphere or anything else of your choosing, and practice moving across the screen using different timing and spacing. Notice how, as you increase your spacing, the object speeds up, and as you create tighter spacing, it slows down. Try accelerating, decelerating, and see what happens when you adjust the timing of the keyframes or when you adjust the curves in the graph editor. I'd suggest working within the front or side view for now so that you're animating on a single plane for simplicity. Have fun, and I'll see you in the next lesson.